Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining me. On a day when the market is very positive following a very good lead from Wall Street, which followed some comments by the Federal Reserve boss, Jerome Powell, who basically implied lower interest rate rises are on the way, which also implies that inflation must be close to peaking. I don't think he'd be saying something like that unless he believed there was a good reason to say that. And it's going to be interesting to see the data coming out tomorrow, which will be the PCE, which is the Fed's favourite inflation reading. And then the day after that, we get the jobs number in the US that also will be a, an important inflation indicator. If all these things work positively for the market, we could see a really big rise in the market. If they are surprisingly bad, the market could go down. So we're at a very interesting point of the market and some big uh, information next week. The Fed is actually meeting on interest rates and we get the US CPI next week. So big, big, big times for the market. And so I talked to Marcus Bogdan. He's the uh, founder of Blackmore Capital and he's the fund manager for the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund, which is a, a dividend playing uh, fund. I'm keen to see how positive he is about 2023. You all know I'm very positive about 2023, despite the fact that there's going to be a lot of curveballs. I think the fact that interest rates will probably peak, inflation will peak, all those things will be great for tech stocks in the US, drive Wall Street up, and that will help our market as well. So I'm, I'm, th I'm very positive in 2023, despite the fact I think there could be some um, growth problems along the way. I think the stock market will do pretty well. Interested to see what Marcus Bogdan is saying. Then we go to Simon Presley. Now Simon's from propertyology.com.au and he really thinks that the, this talk about house prices falling, he reckons there's a lot of BS. Uh, I don't think I can say bullshit on my program, so I'll say BS instead. Um, and interestingly, uh, the Fin Review came out with a story today from uh, Core Data, basically uh, posing the question, is the worst of the house price falls past us? That's very interesting timing. And then I talked to Dr Nicola Powell, who's the Chief of Economics and Research for Domain, to work out what areas are actually doing pretty well for buyers and what areas in the market, the real estate market, are doing well for sellers. And I, I run by her the... The, the, the talk about maybe the worst case scenarios for price falls may, might be behind us and she has a very learned view on the subject. That's the show. Let's kick off now with Marcus Bogdan of Blackmore Capital and the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund. Well, the stock market is poised at a very interesting stage. We've started to see some good run of economic data around the inflation story both in the USA and also here. And stock markets have responded positively. There's two probably very important pieces of data coming out uh, on uh, Friday uh, our time and then Saturday our time and then next week as well with the US CPI. I'm interested to see how a professional fund manager like Marcus Bogdan is seeing the market and how he's playing it right now. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Peter. Yeah. It's uh, an interesting time, isn't it? I, I know, you've, you know you're not as optimistic as me. Um, you're more cautious. And I like that. Mm -hmm. The guy who's managing mm -hmm. the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund, I want you to be cautious. But the run of data at the moment is making, I'm, I presume, is making you a little bit more positive today than you would have been, say, two months ago? We're certainly seeing it's stronger for longer in the economy. Uh, we've had a range of different um, company meetings this week, and it's just fa fascinating to, to hear what is actually happening on the, gro on the ground. But it does look like that um, inflation is peaking, uh, and that is a very significant milestone for the market. Now, the question is, was how far will it start to come back? And I do think we will still see structurally higher inflation, but we're now starting to see it, it peaking. The next thing that we need to see is obviously the peaking of interest rates. And whilst um, the Federal Reserve has indicated a slowing of the, of the rate of increases in interest rates, 
uh, the expectation is that they they may end up being higher than, than anticipated. So we still expect to see further interest rate rises. And ultimately, I think that that will have an impact on, on earnings. Yeah. But what we're seeing on the ground at the moment uh, is more encouraging. Mm. So it, it seems to me, Marcus, that there are, there's two important parts of stock prices. One is expectations and the one is reality. What's actually, mm -hmm. so, so for example, we're waiting for February to see company earnings. And of course, you're getting some, um, some insights now because companies do fess up before um, you know, earnings season starts. Or, so, and so you've alluded to the fact that you've obviously had uh, insights from various companies. And are they better than you expected? Yes, they are. I mean, that trend of uh, stronger for longer. So for an example would be Endeavour Drinks, which owns uh, Dan Murphy, BWS and the hotels business. Um, they're seeing really no signs of consumers stepping back or consumers being far more value focused. Uh, there is an emphasis there, in the, particularly in the hotels business, is of uh, you know really strong levels of food and be and, and beverage sales. Uh, their Ford order book going into December is exceptionally strong, uh, and then in the retail business. Dan Murphy and, and BWS, uh, you know, customers are still buying premium products. And so as, as that keeps on going, that means that, you know, for the full six months of this first part of the financial year uh, should be pretty, pretty good. So when they report in February, the expectation is um, that the results recorded for that period will be very, very sound. In other areas, in, in healthcare, um, we're just seeing a sequential improvement there in demand uh, as people are coming back, um, they're getting procedures done, people are return, re returning uh, to getting testing testing done. So on a, on a range of different areas, um, it, is it is encouraging. Yeah. T taking Endeavour again, I guess it's, it's like you have to anticipate social trends and the social trend of people working from home probably is improving the amount of alcohol that's actually consumed at home rather in the rather than in the bars and the hotels of CBDs where office workers invariably would have gone after work and that's probably really helping the bottom line of a company like Endeavour. Well, I mean, it is, I mean, it, it is somewhat a little bit complex because, I mean, in the hotels, I mean, people are, you know, they're keen to get back into to socialising and their hotel numbers were up 90% on the previous corresponding period. Now, much of that is lockdown and much of that is recovery, but that, um, that recovery is continuing. And interestingly, on Endeavour, uh, the peak in online sales for, for BWS and Dan Murphy was around 12% of total sales. That is now back to around 8%. So people are venturing out of their, their homes. They're actually visiting the stores um, in a physical sense yeah. and they're returning back to back to, to hotels. Oh, yeah. But I, I don't want to harp on this too much. I know I'm right and I know you're wrong. Um, but I, 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 I think there's two things going on. Is not only people get, are buying the, the, the grog in the suburban stores, they're going to hotels because hotels are a much different proposition now. Th think of all the hotels in your area that now have great restaurants and those restaurants are usually booked out and they're then selling wine at much more expensive prices than they would over the counter or whatever. So I just think that the, the whole suburban economy is far more dynamic and far more valuable than it was before the coronavirus. And I think that's been very important to the overall, you know, uh, alcohol industry. Yeah, no, I, I think you are right. And you're seeing those suburban hotels recover um, ex ex exceptionally uh, strong, strongly. And, 
and the offering is far more sophisticated in terms of beverage, in terms yeah. of drinks, being able to order digitally. Uh, and they're seeing that people, as people digi um, order digitally from, from their tables, uh, that they actually, you know, um, they they order um, sort of high, higher priced um, food and, and, and beverage. So all, all of those sort of suburban uh, trends, uh, what you're saying, are absolutely correct. And the value of pubs, what they're selling for, is, is another reflection of that as well. Yes, no, the um, the the demand for pubs is has been absolutely ex exceptional, uh, and you're seeing corporates move into that. Uh, you're seeing a range of entrepreneur entrepreneurs moving into into the into the pubs, and uh, and now you know Endeavour are looking also at the footprint of each actual pub um, and maximizing the space that they have there looking at a com you know accommodation uh, and so they are um, very valuable sites uh, and they're very well sought after at the moment at the moment the the unit price of switzer dividend growth funds have been stepping up nicely what do you think's driving it i i presume part of it is the expectation that dividends are going to hold up but what what, what are the main drivers of the unit price rising well, um, two, two areas, particularly in the last couple of months, um, you've seen a very strong recovery in BHP, and BHP is one of our largest holdings in, um, in the fund uh, and a very, very good dividend uh, uh, provider uh, for our investors. Uh, and the second area has been the banks, uh, particularly C CBA, uh, but both NAB and Westpac, uh, and then on the sort of diversified financials, uh, companies like Suncorp have also been, been quite strong as well. Yeah. So if, if and I, I wrote a story for Swiss, the Switzer Report on Monday, it was a courageous one uh, where I said that I wouldn't be surprised to see 2023 deliver a 10% rise in the overall index. How courageous is that? I can, no, be, I be, you, be honest, you, you, I, I know you're more cautious than me, but how, how courageous is 10% yeah. over 2023? I think if you're looking at, at a total return, um, and that's what we look at, is okay. both price appreciation of the individual shares and the port portfolio, okay. coupled with um, the dividend, um, you know, I think there is... Uh, a degree of realism in that, given that the portfolio's dividend yield is around is around five five percent. Yeah. I would say, look, I think that's that's a high number given the how strong the markets have been in the last cup couple of months. But how I would look at it, I would expect to see still probably three to four percent earnings per share growth, plus the dividend of around five percent. So the total return could be, you know, circa around eight eight percent. Now, if you added back the franking credits on top of that, you could get to that to that number. Yeah. I think that overall, that's a, that's sort of at the the high end. Yeah. Uh, but I do think importantly, we're going to still see some earnings growth, and I think the dividends will will hold up uh, reasonably well. Also, yeah. well, that might surprise you. Well, this might surprise you, uh, Marcus. But I had ten percent plus 4% for dividends, plus 2% for franking. So let's call it 15%. So that's where I'm, I'm <laughs> but we are different. Right. We are different. And that's yeah, why, no, that's no, why I've got you we're running. We're making a market. Yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah, why I, I, I'm happy for you to run our, our more cautious switch to dividend growth fund. But what, I guess what I'm trying to say to people watching the show is that it's not silly to believe that 2023 despite the fact that there will be ups and downs. Uh, after a big sell-off year, we do see rebounds. Of course, this rebound's already started, but there could easily be a pullback, mm. couldn't there? If there's, a, if there's a, a, a surprise bad inflation number over the next week or so, um, or the jobs number in the US is, is too aggressive, the market could pull back. And what I'm trying to say is that if, if, you, if, you, if you want to say from October, I've nearly got that 10% already happening, but I think 2023, mm -hmm. provided we don't get any really surprise curveballs, you know, like Putin inv invading Poland or whatever, mm -hmm. there's a very good mm -hmm. chance that 2023 will be a lot better than 2022. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I, I, I look, I think a, a nice way to summarise is that we still expect to see a lot of volatility. Uh, but if you sort of smooth that volatility out and you look at the underlying economy, uh, you look at the underlying companies that we're investing in, uh, we still expect to see modest earnings growth and modest dividend growth. And I think both of those things will sit much better in 2023. Yeah. And I, I also think, and we saw it last night, as soon as Jerome Powell talked about having smaller interest rate rises, the Nasdaq popped up 4%. And a lot of us are wondering when tech's going to make a recovery. I think sometime in 2023, US tech will make a recovery. That will power the S&P 500 and that will help our index as well. But that's, that's my best guess. And I, I emphasise, it is a guess. It's not a vote. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, <laughs> it's uh, yes, social sciences are an impre imprecise science. Yeah. But I do think to your, to your point, um, you know, bond yields have come back quite significantly. Yeah. Um, and that is really important in terms of those sort of long duration stocks, such as technology, mm. uh, in, ter in terms of their uh, overall, overall valuation. Uh, and we have started to look at more long duration stocks in the portfolio, you know, such as Go Goodman Group. And we're sort of sticking more to those industrial type of stocks and mm. technology stocks. And there's a really important reason why we're doing that in the income portfolio because technology stocks generally have no dividends or very low dividends and we want to have a combination of high dividend payers but also companies that are growing their dividends uh, through the investment cycle. Great stuff. Thanks for joining us, Marcus. Pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Marcus Bogdan of Blackmore Capital and the Switzerland Dividend Growth Fund. Well, joining me now is Simon Presley of a business called Propertyology, and uh, he's got a scoop for us. Um, they've done some analysis on what's happened to house prices and over quite a substantial period of time, and the results are quite astounding. Simon, thanks for joining us. Always a pleasure, Peter. Tell us about the, uh, the work you've done. Yes, yeah, so a report will release uh, next week looking at the last 20 years in this huge country that we call Australia. Um, that we've got 400 individual townships, uh, not, not just our eight capital cities, 136 locations that have a population of 15,000 people or more have seen their median house price triple over the last 20 years. And let's not forget, what have we added? We've had a global health pandemic, we've had a global financial crisis, we've had a national credit crunch, we've had eight prime ministers, um, we've had rising and falling interest rates, but yet yeah. house prices have tripled, mate. We also had a dot-com crash. Yeah, yep. yep. September 11. There are a lot of um, crazy things climbing the wall of worry for both the stock market and the property market, uh, a triple. So what's happened to the big capital cities like Melbourne and Sydney over that time? Because Sydney did have a period where it went sideways, didn't it? Yeah, and look, every, every, 20 years is a long period of time, and every location over that period of time has had several years where the individual property market has been largely flat. Um, Sydney and Melbourne have actually had a couple of significant downturns over, over that 20 year period. Um, most locations have had downturns over the 20 years, but not all. There, there are places like um, Bendigo Byron and, and, and uh, Byron, no, it hasn't really had a downturn. Um, mm. Places like Bendigo and Orange, um, you know, arguably the most consistent property markets in all of Australia over the last 20 years. Um, that they've had their, their single biggest calendar year fall, if we can call it that, a one percent decline. Their <laughs> biggest <laughs> fall in twenty years. So, um, so Sydney and Melbourne done well. Um, five of their eight capital cities. If we were having a discussion this time twenty years ago, Peter, the median house price in five out of eight capital cities was less than two hundred thousand dollars. Places like Brisbane, um, a middle ring. Um, suburban house you would have paid about $170,000 for this time 20 years ago and today it would be worth about $800,000. Yeah, the world has changed, the world has changed. Um, but is there any um, thing, any projection we can take out of that if these 20 years have produced 
triple increases in value, is it likely the next 20 will be less? Uh, look, that gets said any time, I guess, a report like this is produced. Mm. And I would say, I'd have to say no. Um, we go back to the, the decade, we've just been talking about the last 20 years, but if we go back to the decade, the 1970s decade, mm. property prices um, across Australia tripled in just 10 years. In the 1980s decade, property prices tripled again in that 10 years. Those two decades, you and I are old enough to remember, but many mm. are, are aren't, um, uh, the, the, the home loans were often in double digits. We're whinging and sooking at the moment because it's about 5% you know, for a mortgage. Well, mm. for those 20 years, the 70s and 80s, they, they were largely above 10%. Inf inflation, we're sooking about that at the moment as well, aren't we? Inflation's about 6%. But again, in those two decades, inflation was in double digit territory for most of those years. And I'll put it to you that if we were having this discussion in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, everyone would have been saying, well, they can't do that, surely. They can't do that again. They can't triple. Well, they continue to do it. Um, mm. People keep throwing out that, well, they can't go up at that rate if, if wages don't go up at that price. Um, but they keep doing it, mate. So housing shelter, it's an essential commodity. It's not something that goes out of fashion. Mm. Um, it doesn't always go up, but over the course of time, it has always done well. What, what are you seeing in the, the property market right now for investors? Are you, are you seeing them interested as prices start to fall? And do you think when that mortgage cliff is expected to happen in the middle of the year and later in the year when people roll off fixed rates, are you expecting prices to fall a bit faster then and a lot of investors then would be jumping into the market? Uh, this won't be the first and it won't be the last. I've got a contrarian view to uh, what's already happened, let alone what might happen in the future. Mm. Um, it, we don't have a national property market downturn. I know everyone's saying that. We don't. Um, we have um, falling property prices in Sydney and Melbourne and that started about six months before the RBA started increasing interest rates. Large parts of Australia, property prices are still increasing, albeit at a mild rate. Um, there, there are some markets booming, but albeit at a mild rate, that they, aren't, they are not falling. Um, in regards to uh, the cliff, I don't agree with that. Um, property, uh, I'm sorry, mortgage rates, um, some people go fixed, some people go variable. That's always been the case for as long as they've had money and the, and the ability to to borrow them. Um, it's the lemon suckers of the world that refer to it, uh, uh, you know, when, when things come off fixed rates, people are going to struggle. Some will struggle, but I think it's been really poorly reported, um, you know, by and large about uh, rising interest rates. According to our big four banks, Peter, 35% um, of existing mortgage holders are more than two years ahead of their repayments. Mortgage arrears today, um, we're only talking 1% of all mortgages are, are in arrears. That's an all-time record low. And we've got hundreds of billions of dollars screwed away in offset accounts um, and redraw facilities. Um, I, I don't subscribe at all to there's going to be widespread uh, pain from either the rising interest rates or from uh, loans coming off fixed rates. Yeah. Uh, I think there's still uh, enormous pressure under under property markets. What's What we've sort of seen in the last six months is um, the broader public have become spooked. Uh, they've probably forgotten that interest rates go up. And certainly, uh, in, in, in some fairness to consumers, they don't normally go up at the rate that they've gone up in the last six months. So um, it's affected feelings more than finances. People are still paying their mortgage. There is no evidence at all saying people are really, really struggling paying their mortgage. In fact, I just quoted some evidence there to say to the contrary. But I think it's psychological adjustments. Um, you ever try to book a restaurant anywhere in Australia today? They're booked out. Um, you know, re retail trade figures are through the roof, all the discretionary expenses. People are still spending plenty of money, but specific to property, I think they've become spooked about the negative commentary. Um, now, whenever the RBA decides it's found its new normal, I think it's a mugs game forecasting interest rates, but I wouldn't be surprised if the first half of 2023 um, that the broader public become to accept that we're now at that new normal. And that's probably all we need for this spooky uh, behaviour to settle down. 
um, when we've still got record low numbers of properties listed for sale, record low number of properties listed for rent, 700,000 foreigners coming into this country this financial year, that's enormous pressure. When the, when the mood settles down, um, we could see a fast acceleration of asset values. Yep. And so when you see the core logic data coming out, yep. and, and they have been pointing to falling prices, how do you interpret that? Well, I guess 40% of Australia's population live in Sydney and Melbourne. Um, so as always happens, uh, whatever happens in those two cities, it gets reported as if that's the national theme. The core logic Darby referred to, there's eight names each month when they release that. Eight out of 400 individual townships. Uh, about six of those have had property prices fall over the last quarter. But when I say fall, um, minus 0.2% or something. Um, and that's bundling up every single property uh, in a big capital city and giving one number to it. Most of the um, reduction in asset values uh, where there has been some has been at the upper price point. Um, so, for example, in, in Brisbane, property prices above the $1.5 million mark. Um, they might have lost a bit of value, but the standard $800,000 house has probably increased by a little bit of value. But you bundle all those together, and it might appear that the median value declined by 1%. But the everyday meat and potatoes property is probably worth the same now as what it was a quarter ago. And in fact, um, large parts of Australia, the cost, the value of a house today is still significantly more than what it was at the start of this calendar year. Mm. So you you laugh when you hear uh, or read stories about 20 to 30 percent falls in house prices in Australia. I do. Um, there, there, there's there's nothing supporting anything like that at all. And we heard those things this time two and a half years ago when COVID hit our shores, didn't we? Those, those big numbers, the big downturn. And, and two um, years before when Bill Shorten was uh, terrorising the real estate market as well. Yeah, and I think people don't really understand what demand is um, and certainly they underestimate the all-time um, record shortage of properties available either to buy or rent. Um, as we're having this conversation, there are 26% less properties for sale in Australia today than the same time three years ago. And it's this month three years ago when the boom started. The boom, the boom started six months before COVID arrived. Hmm. Um, the big reason that we had that big boom was because there were so few properties listed for sale. There's 26% less for sale now. Hmm. We've got 53% properties available for rent, advertised for rent now than three years ago. Yeah. And we've just opened up the international border. So um, people can think what they think, but I, but I think that they are heavily influenced by unwarranted negative mm. commentary. I, I form my opinions based on the core source, mm. the evidence, the facts, the numbers, um, and they are as strong as what I've ever seen in my professional career. The only missing thing is the confidence piece, which is circling back to the interest rate spooking. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's one difference from that boom that started before Correct. the coronavirus, is that interest rates then were brought down yep. ridiculously low, and that Correct. really fed it. And now interest rates are, are likely to suppress the excessive enthusiasm that people showed at auctions, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, and probably Byron Bay. Uh, totally agree, mate. But the thing is, um, pressure is what causes asset values to increase. Now, when you've got such a record low number of properties listed for sale, you need a lot, lot less buyers than normal for that upward pressure to be created. Um, what we do have at the moment, um, the separate report um, that we're working on, looking at how much equity, extra equity Australian households have now compared to just three years ago. We've got... Uh, of our 150 biggest individual townships in Australia, now people might say 150 biggest, well, what's that? So that's a place like Parks, like Victor Harbour, like Esperance. They have about 15,000 people in them. Yeah. Um, every township in Australia greater than that is in our top 150 townships. 130 out of 150 townships ha have today 
a 40% increase in home values compared to this time three years ago. So that's an enormous amount of capacity in household finances. And we were talking earlier about all the cash in offset accounts and redraw. So um, all, all the money is there within households to transact in real estate. They're just missing the confidence to participate in it. And with such few properties for sale, mate, they, it won't take much for there to be significant pressure. Okay. Good to talk to you, Simon. Always a pleasure, mate. That's Simon Presley from Propertyology. Well, joining us now is Nicola Powell, Head of Research and Economics at Domain. Great to see you, Nicola. Hello. Now, Nicola, why don't we just kick off with uh, an interesting uh, headline I saw from you guys uh, about the, the areas that are good for buyers and the areas that are good for sellers at, at the moment. Do you want to give us a bit of a rundown? So I think what's interesting is we have got a bit of a multi-speed market across our capital cities and really across Australia. And that presents different opportunities for both buyers and sellers in the market. You know, we have got multiple property markets in Australia. And I think that's a timely reminder that there are multiple property cycles going on in any particular city at any one time. And we even see property types perform very differently. And what we're seeing at the moment is we have seen a pullback in price uh, more so in, say, Sydney and Canberra and more so at the upper end of the market. So that does present some opportunities for particularly those upgrade buyers, anybody looking to upsize from maybe a mid price point for houses up to the next level of, of house because we have seen that uh, the upper end of the market pull back more so. And we're also seeing um, unit prices holding up firmer compared to house prices. So again, that speaks to those buyers wanting to perhaps upsize their, their property type. I think for sellers, you know, those, you know, we're still seeing prices well above what they were uh, pre-pandemic. You know, we have seen prices pull back. And in some cities, you know, Adelaide, as an example, is one of those cities that's, still, that's got a, a record high house and unit price. So you've really got to understand the nuances of your particular uh, market. But I think for sellers, particularly um, at that kind of lower and mid price range, we've seen prices hold up better. So there are opportunities no matter what side of the coin you're on. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, let me put you on the spot, Nicola, because you are the head of research and economics at Domain, and Domain, of course, is highly associated with the property market. So, imagine someone, maybe you know, in a, a, a prestigious area in, in Sydney, uh, uh, three or four years ago, it was a seven million dollar house, and it, and it grew to about ten million. That's probably believable, considering the the kinds of rises. That kind of person now, would they be expecting the, that they've gone back to seven or more likely to be in the eights and nines? Look, that is putting me on the spot. And I think, you know, that's pretty realistic to um, say that some of these uh, homes in these prestigious areas have grown by that much. You know, particularly when you look at some of the areas, even in Mornington Peninsula, which saw extraordinary rates mm. of price growth. You know, putting an actual price figure at every property is very different, but I think, you know, what we have seen is that upper price segment has seen greater pullbacks in price. And so for Sydney, that 75, 75th sorry, percentile sits at over 2 million or just above 2 million. Um, so, you know, it's probably not as high as what your mind would um, expect. You know, when you're getting into that um, $7 million range, that is the ultra elite kind of sector of the housing market. Yeah. Yeah, and what I've been told by others uh, who, who are pretty good at the market that with that, in that kind of market, if the house is exquisite with nothing to spend, he said, well, once upon a time, you might have had 10 people bidding, paying ridiculously high prices. You still might have two or three who are prepared to pay ridiculously high prices because the place is, well, A, they can afford it, and B, maybe they're, they're in businesses are still doing well. So they, they can actually still pay those big prices, but the average price, as you pointed out, are falling. Correct. And, and I think you make a really good point there that not every house performs the same. And I think it's those properties that we always see properties that stand out and perform against the odds, even mm. in areas that may be falling. And I think it does depend on the property type. As you say, those homes that 
tick all the boxes. It might be that it's in a particular location. It might have ocean views. It might be in a particular school catchment zone. It might be near an elite prestigious private school. Mm. All of these things influence buyer behavior and mm. people are willing to pay premiums for certain things when it comes to buying home. Yeah, I, I know Tom Panos, who was on this program a few weeks ago talking about, he auctioned the, the block property that Got, got a lot more yeah. than everybody else. And he actually made the point that, okay, there's all suggestions about fun and games going on, but he said that property was the only one that had total privacy. There was no, no one could actually, all the others had others nearby. He said it had a lot more going for it than the other properties. And he said that partly explained why there was a, a, a greater uh, bid for that particular property. What a great observation. You know, privacy is um, very important, I think, for homeowners. Yeah. And it can be small things like that. And the other point you made about, you know, a home that is fully renovated, the cost of, um, you know, extending, renovating a home, the cost of uh, building supplies has escalated. Right. That I don't yeah. think people want to, um, you know, fork out that additional uh, cost of renovating. And if it comes completely done, I think that is attracting that premium as well, because yeah. I think supply chain issues and actually getting trades to do the work is challenging. That's right, because I would say three or four years ago when programs like The Block captured the imagination of the population, everybody wanted to buy a property that they could do up and do ups were getting pretty high prices because people wanted to do it. But you're right, the cost has gone through the roof for building supplies and for builders. It probably has changed the nature of the market. I think so. I think maybe it's, um, you know, they don't want that fixer upper. They want that already done uh, product yeah. in today's environment because it is so challenging, I think, with the skill shortage, with trade shortages um, and supply chain issues, which are still present today, do make it hard for somebody who wants to, to renovate their property that aren't able to do um, some of that mm. renovation themselves. Okay, Nicola, I, I kind of believe that you're not a show off. You don't look like a show off to me. And I know what a show off <laughs> is because probably I am a show off. But you, you, you were never jumping on board the house prices are going to fall by 20 or 30%. And we saw a headline today uh, in the AFR, talking about how maybe the worst of the house price falls could could be behind us. I'm sure you saw that story. Um, it, it has come it out is. of your stable, uh, and it does come from 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 Core Logic. What do you, what do you think uh, about the accuracy of that story? So we do our price series quarterly. Um, so we do it quarterly because we want to take away the volatility, volatility of monthly movements. Yep. So our latest quarter is up to the September quarter. And yep. what we saw um, in September was the steepest uh, fall, quarterly falls that we had ever recorded across the combined capitals hmm. and in some of our capital cities as well. So Sydney, for example, and, and Canberra was one of those areas that saw the steepest quarterly fall on record. What I was expecting, what I predicted uh, when I actually uh, wrote that report was I think that the impact of those um, successive and harsh rises to interest rates have really made a significant impact on the housing market. And I think what we're um, seeing now is we're moving through that period of people are adjusting. I think prospective buyers out there have adjusted to this new environment. You know, we're all expecting interest rates to continue to rise. And I think we're adjusting our mentality and our um, borrowing capacity. We're factoring in future rate hikes. So I think, you know, there is an element that September, I think, saw almost the brunt of those interest rate hikes. I think prices are still going to fall and there are unknowns of next mm. year. You know, mm. we've got that um, cliff of fixed rates mm. um, that yep. were locked in at their low coming coming to an end. At the moment, though, when you have a look at things like we have some unique data sets that looks at the level of distress li listings. So what that does is it looks at the percentage of listings on the market that have some terminology that could deem it as being a distressed sale. So, you know, urgent sale, um, repossessed, um, you know, must sell, yeah. bank repossession, that kind of thing. Um, while we have seen that rise in recent months, the most recent month over October shows that it may be actually coming off of its peak and it still remains below historical levels as well. So 
There are health metrics there that look to show that the market is holding well, considering we've got property prices falling. We're expecting prices to continue to fall next year, but I don't think they're going to fall as hard as what they did over that September quarter. Yeah, the one thing that I, I noted and uh, was we're starting to see um, probably better than expected auction clearance rates. And, and, and I think, and I, I, from personal experience, a couple of people I know, uh, one guy in particular got offered a, a really good price for his house in Melbourne and he deliberated over it for a few weeks and then the buyer dropped out. And I figure the buyer saw all the negative headlines and the scary stuff happening and said, well, I'm silly buying now, I should wait a while. But then those people proposed would probably reassess after seeing the latest story, thinking maybe I better get in if I can, you know, if I've got the money, and I can get the the, um, the property. I, I think we're going to start seeing a, a, a lot more less opportunism from from buyers. If buyers need a property, they probably did hold fire, and it makes perfect sense. But those people might start reevaluating whether they can afford to miss out on an opportunity to buy. It is that balance and I think some buyers do try to pick uh, the trough in a market and actually it's extremely hard to pick a mm. peak and a pick a trough and, and be yeah. absolutely perfect uh, on your timing. And the longer that you wait, prices may pull back uh, a little, um, more, well they are going to pull back, but your borrowing capacity is also going to be damaged. So you've got to weigh up those pros and cons of whether you're waiting uh, for prices to drop and see your borrowing capacity deteriorate even further. So yeah. I do think it does depend on um, circumstance from buyers. And I think, you know, we did some analysis recently, looked at all of the historical price cycles across our combined capital cities. And the one thing that it showed us is, um, you know, there's been roughly about eight price cycles over the last 30 years. Um, and what it showed us is that the upswing is steeper and longer than the subsequent downturn. And so, you know, those lessons tell us that it's not necessarily timing the market, it's time spent in the market that actually counts. Yeah. You're starting to sound like a stock market tipster as well. That's exactly what I say. <laughs> Nicola, thanks very much for joining us in the program. Thank you for having me. Okay. That's Nicola Power from Domain. And that's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're back on Monday. And among other things, I'm going to look at the company Zero. A few of our commentators, friendly commentators, have posed questions about uh, people like myself and Rudy and Paul and just about everybody else. I think Jim Baylou, they all like Zero, But people are wondering whether we're talking our own book. I'll run you through the objective reasons why you might believe that Zero does have some upside, though it might take longer than many people would want it to be. That's the show for Monday. Look forward to seeing you then. Don't, remember, don't forget switzerreport.com.au for more information and more ideas about investing.